No. Mr. Debuist from Belgium. Mrs. Carmeli Martinez from Spain. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak in, in Spanish. Eh, la invasión rusa de Ucrania ha demostrado lo peor a lo que son capaces de llegar los tiranos. Hemos visto una violación de derecho internacional, un atentado contra los derechos eh, humanos y, en cualquier, y contra cualquier regla internacional sobre los conflictos. Sin embargo, también hemos visto otro aspecto menos conocido, pero igual de destructivo, y con el que tenemos que mirar con una visión a medio y largo plazo que, eh, que ha producido esta invasión, y es la utilización del medio natural como una víctima más de las ambiciones territoriales de un dictador como Putin. No solo se ha amenazado de forma abierta con utilizar la central de, Z eh, de Zaporilla como arma, con la voluntad de que la radio radioactividad resultante acabara con los ecosistemas y con la vida de miles de personas. En lo que llevamos de invasión rusa, más de 900 de las áreas naturales protegidas de Ucrania han sido destruidas por las actividades militares de las tropas rusas. Es más, alrededor del 30% de todas esas áreas protegidas de Ucrania, que suponen unos 1,2 millones de hectáreas, están sufriendo los efectos de la guerra. Es necesario que desde la OSCE impulsemos un marco de actuación que permita investigar esta situación, depurar responsabilidades y llevar, cuando llegue el momento, a sus responsables ante la justicia. Los liberales españoles así lo hemos propuesto en nuestro Parlamento y esperamos encontrar a otras fuerzas políticas en esta sede, en esta Asamblea, a nuestro lado para conseguir eso, para proteger el medio ambiente, para responsabilizar a quienes han perpetrado esta invasión y para recuperar el patrimonio natural de Ucrania. Queremos también aprovechar esta intervención eh, para dar una vez más nuestro apoyo a Ucrania, a su presidente, a su gobierno y a todos los ciudadanos que hoy todavía siguen luchando cada día como pueden para, para, para resistir y sobre todo para resistir no solo la guerra sino todo, todas las circunstancias que, que la rodean como la falta de electricidad, la falta de alimentos y, y la falta incluso de, de ayuda humanitaria. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Now Mr. Chural Galielif from Azerbaijan. Thank you. Uh, dear chairperson, dear colleagues, references by the Armenian delegation to democracy and human rights are derisory in nature. We remind that these references are made by the country which, during its aggression against Azerbaijan, committed countless grave violations of human rights of Azerbaijanis, subjecting them to ethnic cleansing, forcible expulsion, and other gross war crimes, and denying them their basic human rights for years. Thus, Armenia is the last country in, in this assembly to criticize and lecture us on the issues related to democracy and human rights. We regret that the delegation of Armenia continues to misuse the international platforms, including the OECPA, to project its false narrative and demonize Azerbaijan. These attempts are complete distortion of facts and realities on the ground. Before accusing Azerbaijan, we would advise the Armenian representative to reflect on violations of human rights in his own country. We remind that Armenia only during this year, in Armenia, police officers obstructed and assaulted protesters, journalists have been silenced, civil society activists have faced violence. Azerbaijan is on the record, including in this assembly, for tirelessly promoting the signing of a peace treaty based on the five basic principles grounded in international law including mutual recognition of and respect for the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and inviolability of international recognized borders and political independence of each other. The key word here, here is mutual, the limitation and demarcation of state border and unblocking of regional communications. Progress along these tracks falling within the scope of bilateral relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan is indispensable to durable peace in the region. However, Armenia keeps evading from implementation of its obligations and delays normalization process between two countries. So now all efforts must be directed at ongoing post-conflict normalization process between the two countries and we call Armenian delegation to come to table to Azerbaijan and to find a final peace deal between the two nations. Thank you. Thank you. Now Mrs. Eli Samili from Belgium. The floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, to start off, I want to reiterate my support to the brave and sovereign nation of Ukraine that is fighting for its independence in its very existence against Russian military aggression. I strongly condemn the missile attacks and bombings of Ukraine cities and uh, vital infrastructure, leaving many civilians without water or electricity just now, winter is rapidly approaching. These uh, Russian war crimes are a consequence of losing ground and trying to break the Ukraine will to endure their war effort. Dear colleagues, I believe the OSCE is a favored uh, forum for diplomacy and collective security in Europe between NATO and its partners on the one hand and Russia on the other. Most of all, we wanted to prevent this bloodshed on the border of Europe, reminding us of the darkest pages in our history. Now we must do all that is in our power to prevent both. Now that the war has come to a status quo that will be difficult to change, no time is better for de-escalation and dialogue. The only durable long-term solution to this awful crisis is a diplomatic and political one. Thank you. And now, Mr. Mr. Rosat from Poland. Rosati. Rosati from Poland. He isn't here. He's not here. So let's try again. Our colleague from Lithuania, Mrs. Alekliate Ambra Michiele. Mrs. Maka Bocho Raswild from Georgia. No. Thank you. I'm here. Okay. The floor is yours, please. Dear colleagues, uh, we are gathered here in Warsaw, members of Parliamentary Assembly, of the organization which was created to ensure peace and security in Europe. But as we speak here, the norms of, and principles of international law are being undermined, the principles on which European security is based. We have to remember that aggression against Ukraine is a continuation of the same pattern Russia has started in Georgia, resulting in ongoing occupation of Georgia's two integral regions, Abkhazia and Tsinvali. Georgia has repeatedly experienced Russian aggression and continues to fight against Russian occupation and painful consequences even today. Therefore, we know well the bitter taste of Russian aggression and occupation and stand in strong solidarity with Ukraine and Ukrainian people. Russia bears full responsibility for its brutal actions and it is imperative that accountability for all those who are responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity are ensured. Unfortunately, in 2008, when Georgia became victim of Russian aggression, our territorial integrity was blatantly violated. The international community failed to give an adequate response that would prevent the same actions in Europe. Today, we must speak with one voice and make it clear that there is no place for brutal military invasions in Europe. We have to be clear and firm. States should not be punished for exercising their sovereign rights to choose their own present and future. Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova aspire to be integral part of the European Union, and we have full right to implementation of our sovereign choice, and Russia should be stopped and not allowed to prevent it with its aggressive policies. Thank you. Now, uh, the, um, our colleague, Mr. Ivan Krulko from Ukraine. The floor is yours. Thank you. So, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chairperson, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to say, firstly, that it is better to live without light, but also without Russia. For nine months of war, the Kremlin has failed to reach its main goal, conquest of Ukraine, and has instead tried to shift its powerlessness to civilian infrastructure and people. Mass crimes, including murder of civilians, bombing of residential areas, deliberate strikes on critical infrastructure, missile terror on peaceful Ukrainian cities. On November 15, and yesterday, Russians 
target critical infrastructure facilities in a number of regions, in all regions, with massive missile strikes causing wonder spread blackouts. This attack on the energy system was, was the most massive since the beginning of uh, the war, leaving millions of Ukrainians without power, without water, and the supply of electricity. Russian terror is not limited to our national borders. It's only a matter of time before it goes further. The massive shelling of the energy infrastructure of Ukraine may also have an impact on the energy system of some neighboring countries, like, for example, Moldova, as the Russian forces are hitting both generation plants and the electricity transformation system. Russia's illegal war on Ukraine is also an attack on the OSCE principles and values. And tom tomorrow, during standing committee, OSCE parliamentary assembly has very good chance to demonstrate that values are important for us. And I call to all delegates to do it tomorrow. And finally, I want to say, a country of generators, and we need generators, of course, more than we have, is always stronger than country of degenerates. Thank you. Thank you, dear colleague. And now, Mr. Devist from Belgium. The floor is yours. Thank you, yeah. Thank you uh, Mrs. Chairman. So, dear colleagues, uh, let me start by clearly condemning also the Russian invasion and the Russian war in Ukraine. This is a violation of international law and also the highest violation of uh, the UN Charter. And it is not only a clear violation of the territorial integrity of the sovereign state of Ukraine, but the war also brings about um, untold misery and hardship, death and destruction to millions of innocent uh, citizens. But the question we should also ask ourselves is, how do we end this war as soon as possible? How do we stop the death of so many innocent civilians? How do we reach an armistice as soon as possible? And there are, generally speaking, two ways to end an armed conflict. That is through diplomacy and negotiations, or until the military victory is achieved by one of the parties. So that is why I, I, I believe and I think that diplomatic solution and negotiated settlement is uh, preferable uh, above a long during a war, because I think it's, um, it's, it's now urgent to reach this negotiated settlement. It's necessary, and I think it's also possible. And we believe that the OSCE should, should take the lead in diplomatic efforts because when the armed conflict broke out in eastern Ukraine in 2014, several attempts were made to end it. The so-called Minsk agreements where the OSCE played an important role. And even though these agreements ultimately failed to maintain the peace in the region, the OSCE should renew and intensify its attempts to reach at least an armistice and to guarantee that the basic rules of international and humanitarian law are respected and uh, restored. And more and more people these days are calling for the uh, diplomacy and peace talks to end this war. And it is just, it's not just a peace movement. Even US top General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, has stated that we need a strong push towards a uh, diplomatic uh, solution. So uh, I think we also need um, a broader vision on security uh, within Europe, uh, based on multilateral relations, diplomacy, and disarmament on the long run because you can only achieve peace between nations if uh, we do not stop to try actively invest in peace on the basis of and the principle of cooperative security. I feel safe when you feel safe because this, I think, is, uh, the, reason, is the reason why the OECE was uh, founded in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Mr. Mehmet Said Kirazoglu from Turkey. Is Thank he you, here? Madam Chair. Uh, esteemed colleagues, I would like to thank panelists for their informative presentations. As known, this ongoing aggression continues to cause economic challenges, increasing challenges due to recent record spikes in energy prices and supply shortages 
are clear indica indicator of the OSC's relevance in this field. We believe that energy transition to the renewables and clean energy along with more secure and connected energy networks need to continue to be on top of our agenda. The energy crisis has shown the importance of root diversity for supply security. Uninterrupted free trade and connectivity stands out as a matter of economic security in order to secure stable and sustainable transportation and supply chain. Turkey has been supporting various combined initiatives together with the relevant countries. We have achieved many connectivity projects, in, including Baki Tiflis Cars Railway, along with oil and gas pipe pipeline projects. All these projects serve the purpose of the enhancing connectivity between the East and West. Similar issues have been elab elaborated during the fourth international parliamentary conference of the Silk Road Group within the OSCPA, which was held on 18-19 October 2022 in Istanbul and reflected in the Istanbul Declaration adopted at the said conference entitled Strengthening Connectivity to Ensure Energy and Food Security in Times of Crisis. Dear colleagues, Food security should be in our focus. The Black Sea Grain Initiative market a turning point in how we put the needs of those who are in vulnerable situation, even at the times of war. The UN, Turkey, and relevant parties have spared no effort to limit the suffering of those dependent on fertilizer and grain exports for their food security. The initiative has already moved millions of tons of grain and food stuff it brought the global food prices down. As a result of this initiative, the World Food Programme was able to intervene before famine took hold. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now uh, from Hungary, uh, Dora Duro, dear colleague, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear Madam Chairperson. The peace is the most important for every one of us, I think. But unfortunately, the mainstream media and politicians from Western Europe usually consider countries either pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian in questions related to the war and its economic consequences. However, it is a faulty approach because every politician can and should make decisions based on their own country's best interest. If I, as a politician representing Hungary, say that I don't want Hungary to be devastated in this war, which is, in fact, a game of the great powers, namely the USA and Russia, I'm neither pro-Russian and I'm nor pro-Ukrainian. I am definitely pro-Hungarian. I firmly believe that we do have the right to decide in accordance with our own interests whatever the issue is in connection with the economic consequences of the war. All this is important because it is clear that one of the greatest losers of the whole war is Europe, and one of the winners is the USA. As European politicians, we cannot take a stance which comes with weakening Europe, making our people poor, and making them, making them give up their safety and future. We have to care for providing safe energy and food. This must be our main objective. So we have to make it clear that the sanctions do not work. Let's put an end to hypocrisy and the nearsighted way of thinking. The safety and the future of Europe and our countries must come first. Thank you. And you were on time as well. Uh, Mr. Christos Senekis from Cyprus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, preliminary monitoring of the environmental impact of the war in Ukraine conducted by the United Nations Environment Program points to severe air, water, and land pollution. The degradation of ecosystems in urban and rural environments could leave the country and the, the region with a toxic legacy for generations to come. The full range of severity of the environmental consequences will require verification and assessment. Therefore, the access to competent international organizations must be 
must be made possible and be facilitated. Needless to say that any radiation leakage in Ukraine will have long-lasting devastating effects to vast regions of Europe and Middle East. The latest blast near Zaporizhia power plant are a constant reminder that a nuclear catastrophe could not uh, be excluded. The implementation of nuclear safety and security protection zone around nuclear facilities as soon as possible remains an uh, imperative and very urgent necessity. Aside as severe environmental consequences of the ongoing war in Ukraine, its huge economic impact is also looming range large. The much needed diversification of sources of energy supplies must be keep the energy bills of our citizens and business reasonably, uh, reasonably priced, while efforts to increase the share of clean sources in our energy mix must continue. In this respect, Cyprus has engaged in promoting cooperation and synergies with countries of the region, namely Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, which can make, make a substantial contribution to, towards achieving the diversification and security of energy supply. Moreover, the Euro-Asia interconnector will connect Cypriot, Greek, and Israeli power grids and will supply energy to continental Europe from renewable sources and low emission natural gas discoveries in the Eastern Mediterranean and can also significantly contribute towards achieving uh, this goal. Dear colleagues, while Europe and the US are sustaining significant economic losses as a result of sanctions imposed on Russia to terminate its violations of international law, other countries seek to harness economic benefits by actively helping evade the scope and impact of the sanctions in total disregard of the costs borne of our uh, citizens. In this regard, Turkey enjoys a large list of benefits in tourism, banking, and energy se uh, sectors as a result of its evasive uh, neutral stance and its role as a mediator for peace between Russia and Ukraine, a role which is in stark contrast with its own record regarding violations of international law and human rights resulting from Turkey's invasion in Cyprus in 1974 and the ongoing occupation of the island, as well as the continuously provocations regarding the Greek islands in Aegean Sea. Such opportunistic tax Thank tactics you, must Senekis. not be selective, overlooked, and or tolerant if we really wish to, for peace and stability to prevail and for the rules rules-based international order to be kept alive. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now our dear colleague from France, Olga Givernet. The floor is yours. Merci, Madame la Présidente, chers collègues. Disposer d'une énergie propre en quantité suffisante et à un prix accessible pour les citoyens comme pour les entreprises représente une condition fondamentale pour préserver notre sécurité économique et environnementale. Des efforts considérables ont été réalisés depuis plus de 20 ans pour atteindre cet objectif du développement des énergies décarbonées. Mais malgré les progrès significatifs accomplis dans ce domaine, la crise actuelle autour du conflit de l'Ukraine a révélé combien nous étions encore trop dépendants d'énergies fossiles carbonées comme le pétrole, le gaz ou le charbon. Nous savons pourtant à quel point elles nuisent à l'environnement, en particulier au climat et à la santé des populations. Face à l'urgence créée par cette crise, une démarche trop souvent oubliée ou négligée par le passé est à nouveau mise en avant dans, le, dans beaucoup de pays, la sobriété. Elle fait d'ailleurs l'objet d'une étude particulière au sein du Parlement français pour laquelle je suis rapporteur. Dans son dernier rapport, le groupement intergouvernemental des experts sur l'évolution du climat consacre pour la première fois un chapitre entier à la sobriété et en donne une définition précise. Il s'agit d'un ensemble de mesures et de pratiques quotidiennes qui permettent d'éviter la demande d'énergie, de matériaux, de terre et d'eau, tout en assurant le bien-être de tous les êtres humains dans les limites de la planète. Concrètement, la sobriété énergétique vise à réduire la consommation d'énergie par des changements volontaires et organisés de nos comportements, de nos modes de vie et d'organisation collective. Sobriété énergétique et efficacité énergétique sont deux concepts bien distincts. La sobriété est d'ordre comportemental et implique les changements de nos habitudes de consommation. L'efficacité énergétique agit sur la technologie pour réduire les consommations d'énergie pour un service identique. 
Cette démarche de sobriété doit impérativement être accompagnée par nos, nous, responsables politiques, seuls à même de prendre les mesures permettant de faciliter les changements dans les comportements, les modes de vie et les modes d'organisation sociale, afin de les rendre souhaitables, sans distinction au sein de la population. En conclusion, la sobriété énergétique ne peut devenir un outil puissant, tous ensemble, aux côtés des énergies décarbonées et de l'efficacité énergétique, pour accélérer la transition écologique. Je vous remercie. Thank you. And now, from Finland, Mrs. Inka Hopsu. Madam Chair, dear colleagues, the war in Ukraine causes shocking humanitarian crisis. My thoughts are with the Ukrainians and all who suffer because of war, especially children. We must do our utmost so that every Ukrainian child can continue their school path immediately be it in the midst of a crisis in Ukraine or in our countries. School and the company of other children bring a sense of security and give hope of a normal life. Being in the school is already psychosocial support. Distance learning is not enough, although it helps. War also has an impact on environment, which can be seen very concretely in Ukraine. The country of huge environmental diversity is home to tens of internationally significant wetlands. All this is under threat. The acts of war also raises the risk of forest fires and the risk of pollution to water sources by toxic waste of ammunition. The environment suffers from the effects of tanks, broken war machinery, and even nuclear waste. In addition to human suffering, the environmental impact of war will have far-reaching consequences. The environmental impact of war is not limited to Ukraine's border, as countries are struggling to ensure energy security in the temptation to water down emission targets and climate change measures increase. Yes, the energy crisis forces us to find alternative energy sources to oil and gas, but we must not do this at the cost of cutting emissions and fossil fuels. Ensuring energy security and tackling climate change are two problems with one solution, sustainable renewable energy. All investments should now be di directed towards technology, technologies like solar and wind power, at the same time as we should encourage energy efficiency and saving. Ukrainians and we all need resolution to this war. Only through peace we can build a tomorrow where people and nature live in harmony. Thank you. Uh, I have to say that the list of speakers is closed, so we cannot add any more speakers, and I will give you the chance to reply. Now, uh, from Canada, Mr. David Wells. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Honorable colleagues, when we met during our session in Birmingham, I shared with you my concerns about the effects of the war in Ukraine on fuel and global energy markets. Not only has the war caused great suffering for the people of Ukraine, the cost of the war is also being felt around the world through higher energy prices, and this continues to feed the Russian war machine, such as it is. Russia's aggression in Ukraine has led to disruptions in global energy markets, and we see that our energy supply is volatile and vulnerable. As the world's second largest crude exporter, Russia sells about 5 million barrels of oil daily. About 60% of Russia's oil exports go to OECD Europe. Major, major importers of Russian petroleum want to reduce their dependence. We all recognize that energy security is a central component of the OSCE's mission to promote comprehensive security. European representatives have clearly conveyed the need for an alternative source to Russian oil and gas, and they need a stable supply for the long term. Substituting Russian imports with those of a close and reliable ally like Canada's, and we hold the third largest reserves in the world, is one obvious step we can take together. I'm disappointed that the leadership of my country continues to hinder responsible petroleum resource development at a time when our friends need it most. Colleagues, while climate change is important, we must recognize that there is also a change in the geopolitical climate. 
There is a humanitarian crisis at our doorstep, and it's necessary to make it harder for Russia to fund its war with petroleum sales on a business-as-usual basis. States like Canada, with the capacity to help supply other countries with natural resources like oil and gas, must stand ready to be part of the solution. This is what the signatories of the Helsin Helsinki Final Act, which led to the creation of the OSCE in 1975, believed in. They committed to economic cooperation with the belief that it contributes to the reinforcement of peace and security in Europe and in the world as a whole. We must continue to defend these values and commitments. Russia would love nothing more than to see us fail. Thank you. And now from North, now from Northern Macedonia, uh, Halil Shinopche. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, after the aggression of Russia in Ukraine, it was changed the concept of the welfare in the European region. Until now, it was based in cheap price of energy coming from Russia. Uh, the cheap price was supposed to be useful, safe, and stable. But after the aggression, it was proved that it was not the case. Europe had to find another way for energy within the European Union. It would be very unlogical to replace one dependency with another. The best energy is the one which is produced inside your home. This will bring big economic reconstruction. Before the Russian aggression in Ukraine, everyone, everyone who believed in neoliberal globalization have said the money hasn't smelled, which means it has a nationality, neither geopolitics. But now everyone is becoming aware that it has a geopolitical weight. Of course, along with economical entrepreneurship, there are also political goals. It has always been like that. Economy is a horse, politics is a knight. Neoliberals were blind, or they threw ashes in their eyes when they said that horses can race without a rider and everyone wins. So the world is changing. Europe is, not, is no longer a flowery garden where are the spectators who see the change from afar. The Europe now is one of the centers of great changes. Are our governments thinking about the consequences and possibilities that open such an economic reconstruction of EU? Now, when European companies have closed their factories in Russia, would someone think and work for their approach in our countries? Now, when energy, is uh, when energy is becoming a sector with great benefits for those who produce, will our countries be able to make an ambitious strategy for state, not private, production? The strategy that combines the development of the potentials of our countries. There is a possibility that our countries, I mean the countries from Western Balkan, of course, if we, invest, if we are investing properly, not with abusive and bankrupt private individuals, we can become energy exporters within a few years. We must do everything to use this chance. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Philip Lawrence from Canada, please, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you, Honorable Chair, uh, fellow uh, parliamentarians. Scott. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about anti-corruption efforts in the context of our discussions regarding global security. As we know, and it's right to say, good governance is incredibly important to having a prosperous and peaceful nation. However, we have seen a decline in good governance across the world, which is troubling. According to the Corruption Perception Index, in 2021, we have witnessed over the past decade 131 countries making no significant uh, progress with respect to fighting corruption. And we've had uh, uh, only 25 nations make significant progress, with 23 nations actually seeing a rise uh, in, in corruption in their country. And this uh, chair has a, has a significant con uh, impact, because in the same time, we've seen a decline in the amount of democracies. Uh, we are actually at a record low of, uh, of democracy since 1997. Um, and in fact, uh, we are now less than 38% of people, according to Freedom House, are free peoples. This is troubling. And in, in Canada, we've taken some action with the passing of the Magnitsky Act to hold those folks who are uh, corrupt officials to account. And I'm proud to right now to be sponsoring a bill in our legislation to give parliamentarians oversight over the imposition of those sanctions. We need to be strong because Internal repression and corruption are often the seeds of external aggression. 
And we have seen that as Sergei Maninsky years ago raised the red flag about the Russian Federation and he was eventually, he eventually died in a Russian prison. We need to honor his memory and we need to be bold as an organization and we need to be able to suspend a, a member who is flagrantly disregarding the principles of which this organization was founded. Thank you. Uh, from Romania, our colleague Christine Thelman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, honorable guests, dear colleagues. I would like to address in this uh, second uh, session um, extremely important subject regarding weaponizing of food by Russia that directly impacts especially low and middle income countries and global food prices and intensify already food insecurity. As we already are all aware, many countries are seriously affected by the shortages in exporting the Ukrainian grains. Romanian's efforts have been multidimensional and multi-institutional in order to accelerate the processing of Ukrainian grains in Romania and facilities and subsequently transfer them to different parts of the world. The Black Sea proved more than ever its strategic relevance in this context, and Romania became an important transit country for grains coming from Ukraine. Since the beginning of the uh, Russian invasion, more than 8.4 million tons of Ukrainian grains and oil seeds have already transited the Romanian ports. Constanza, the largest harbor in the Black Sea, has become one of the main maritime gateway from Ukraine grain. In addition, we upgraded the broad Gauk railway links, uh, that links Ukraine to Romania, and therefore Galatz, an important commercial city in my country, is able to process the trains from Ukraine through the railroad. I would like to emphasize the international tools that Romania is part of that contribute to stabilizing the world food market and improve global food security. The UN brokered agreement, together with the EU-Ukraine solidarity lane, has made a significant difference by allowing the export of grain and agriculture products from Ukraine to the global market and to the countries most in need, including the Horn of Africa, Yemen, and Afghanistan. In this context, we need to underline the and make everyone aware that the EU sanctions against Russia do not prohibit the export of agriculture of food products between third countries and Russia. Romania continues to be highly committed to support Ukraine and to contribute to stabilizing world food markets and improve global food security. Thank you. Thank you. And now from Lithuania, our colleague Aleknaid Abra Mikien. He's not here. Then we move on to Hungary and our colleague, Monica Bartos. Madam Chair, thank you for the floor. In the morning, one of our respected uh, colleagues mentioned that we are elected representatives, so uh, we are responsible for our voters. But what is the interest of our inhabitants in our, in, in our countries? For example, in connection with economic environment and humanitarian issues. And I, can, I think we can sum this up in one word, peace. And we representatives do our best if we serve the peace. Hungary continue to stand for territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And we condemn Russia's military aggression. War cannot be a solution for any problem. Reacting to the extremely worrying humanitarian situation in our neighboring country, we have launched one of the largest humanitarian relief operations in the history of Hungary. We are continuously providing care for refugees arriving in Hungary. And Hungary supports all efforts aimed to start a meaningful dialogue between the relevant partners, because peace without dialogue cannot be achieved. Without peace negotiation, in the near future, the global community will, will face severe consequences, even more so than before. Any action that leads to the prolongation of the conflict is also contributing 
to the escalation of the humanitarian and economic crisis, both regionally, regionally and globally. Negotiations are essential for ending the senseless suffering of millions of people. And in this way, we can serve the interest of our inhabitants. And that is peace. Thank you for your kind, kind attention. Thank you. And from European Court of Auditors, Marek Opiola. Please, Thank the you. floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. My name is Marek Opiola. I am the member of the European Court of Auditors in Luxembourg. Although our organization don't have traditional established cooperation, I am pleased to attend this session to demonstrate that we can contribute to each other's work. I would like to thank Mrs. Bartuś, head of the Polish delegation, for recognizing this opportunity and invite me here. The European Court of Auditor is very much engaged in supporting the Accounting Chamber of Ukraine and its involvement in various professional committees. Supporting by the ECHA, the Accounting Cham Chamber of Ukraine obtained the observer status in the Assembly of EU Supreme Audit Institution. Secondly, we contributed to the exchanges of expertise and training of professionals. We have offered the Accounting Chamber of Ukraine the possibility to second staff member to the ECA as short time second national expert. Currently, we have five extraordinary professionals joined to the ECA. There was also a number of discussion on how our audit could address the impact of the war and the court's 2023 war program includes relevant audit tasks. In the upcoming year, we will, for example, examine U.S. supporting for refugees from Ukraine, economics efforts of the invasion, and the economic governments in lighting of the new realities and consequences resulting, among other, from the war in Ukraine. The court is currently working on this opinion on the target and amendment of the EU financial regulation in relation to providing financial assistance to Ukraine from the EU budget through the course of 2023. We intended to publish in the next week. I would like to kind invite you to follow the result of our work. I am sure you will find them interesting and useful in your daily parliamentary work. Thank you. Thank you. And now from Austria, our colleague David Stockoyer. Thank you, dear Chair, dear colleagues. We are seeing today more than ever that environmental security and energy independence must be central to our um, contemporary understanding of security. Europe has witnessed a colossal effort in taking own energy independence and of Russians' hands away from the Russians' hands and into our own hands. Austria alone has, uh, for our country has alone, has, with the help of allies, reduced our dependence on Russian gas from 85 persons to 20 persons and counting. This effect, effort shows that uh, committed regional cooperation can and does work. We must take many lessons from the UK, uh, from the United, uh, uh, from the uh, from the Ukraine crisis into the post-war world. And the second thing I want to mention here is that we have, or we are in front of a big, uh, I don't know, it's like climate collapse is a face us all, it's a big crisis what's in front of us, what we have to mention, and it's a big problem. And I think I'm not alo alone here in the room, and there are many people, young people, uh, who are really disappointed, angry about the result of the COP27 conference in Egypt, uh, in the painted depressive picture for a global cooperation, a picture in which powerful nations blindly put economics interests over human ones, uh, a picture in which the number of fossil fuel lobbyists outweighs the number of conference delegates, and hopes for a globally binding agreement are once again deferred to the next year as a time for meaningful climate action runs out. 
Dear colleagues, dear friends, the OECD exists to provide a forum through which to enhance security and enable cooperation. Well, it's clear to me that if we cannot work together better and quickly, our security challenge will only multiply. Environmental security is security. We cannot fight climate change with guns, but if we do not fight climate change, conventional threats and human suffering will only multiply. The time to act is now. Thank you, David. And now, Mrs. Gudrun Kukler from Austria. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Chair. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, now you will wonder why there's two Austrians speaking, one after the other. But the reason is that I do not speak as an Austrian member of parliament, but as the rapporteur for the second committee. And uh, I would just like to emphasize today that I'm listening to what you are saying uh, with the eyes of a rapporteur, because I'm wor working on our report, I'm working on the resolution for next year. And there is also here in the room our chair of the committee, Asai Guliev, here uh, on this side, and our vice chair, Arto Gerasimov, from Ukraine, is unfortunately not here. But we are listening to what you say so that we can incorporate your concerns, your suggestions into our work. And as we note from the multiple crises of our time, we see that the second committee really moves to the center of all attention. Almost, you could say, the second committee is the committee of our future. We want to work towards prosperity in our region and prosperity needs as a prerequisite peace, it needs security, and it needs cooperation. This is what we want to work towards with your help and please do not hesitate to contact us with any other concerns that come to your mind in the next couple of weeks and months. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, my dear friends. And now from Spain, our colleague, Jose Agensi Sabader. Eh, gracias, señora presidenta, queridos colegas, queridas colegas. Eh, España es corresponsable con la causa ucraniana. La causa de Ucrania es la causa de España. España es un país que está cerrado a filas desde el principio con la ayuda y con el apoyo a Ucrania y contra la agresión eh, rusa, la agresión de Putin, que ha, ha, ha devastado un país y amenaza además con la estabilidad del resto de Europa. España sabe perfectamente que esto como son las fichas del dominó. Si cae Ucrania, caerían otros países a continuación. Es la causa de España. España ha prestado, en ese sentido, una ayuda muy importante. Hay 135.000 ucranios y ucranias en España, en condición de eh, residentes temporales, y 35.000 niños y niñas que están escolarizados. El apoyo militar ha sido muy importante, es muy importante también el apoyo económico, el apoyo internacional en todos los foros internacionales a la causa de Ucrania. Máxime ahora, cuando resulta que no solamente la brutalidad del ejército eh, ruso está eh, siendo evidente ¿no? y ha sido mm, calificado de terrorista ¿no? en la última sesión del Parlamento Europeo, sino que además esto que está deshonrando a un ejército porque no se puede mm, incumplir las leyes, las leyes de la guerra, no se puede intentar rendir a una sociedad por hambre, por frío. Esto está fuera incluso de los más elementales principios que rigen las leyes de la guerra. Y por tanto, la ayuda ahora ha de ser aún mayor. Ha de ser mayor porque eh, estamos implicados en una situación que puede terminar eh, asolando y eh, complicando el orden internacional. Sabemos que Ucrania va a resistir, sabemos que se va a restablecer el orden internacional. Y cuando ese día llegue, que llegará también, ahí me gustaría que esta organización, la OSCE, que esta organización se mantuviera unida y fuera un actor importante en ese momento que tiene que llegar y que debe asegurar la paz, la libertad y el orden internacional. Thank you. And now, uh, from Azerbaijan, Mr. Tural Kanchalinev.
He's not here? Okay. From Spain, Mr. Anton Comes Reino. Buenas tardes a, a todos y gracias. Es un, bueno, es un honor y es un placer volver a encontrarnos aquí desde la perspectiva de que esta organización nació precisamente bueno, en tiempos muy complicados y tiempos muy oscuros. Creo que todos y todas, uh, probablemente nuestras sociedades, no pensaron que nos íbamos a volver a ver en el contexto una, europeo en una guerra como en la que estamos, en una guerra de invasión por parte de la Federación Rusa a Ucrania. Y creo que, bueno, esta es uh, probablemente, además de una inesperada noticia, la peor noticia, la peor noticia, evidentemente, para el pueblo ucraniano, que lo está sufriendo también para una parte del pueblo ruso que se opone dignamente a la invasión, y la peor noticia también para los grandes desafíos que tenemos eh, a nivel civilizado. Eh, me refiero, obviamente, a la cuestión climática, a la cuestión de la transición ecológica y también, evidentemente, a la cuestión de construir un mundo democrático y en paz. En ese sentido, bueno, eh, creo que se han hecho diferentes eh, alegatos eh, hoy y creo que hay que decirlo también. La guerra no puede ocuparlo todo. Evidentemente, la guerra, la guerra tiene que ser la principal de nuestras tareas, eh, asistir a quien sufre la guerra y poner todas nuestras energías en pararla, pero también es cierto que no puede ocuparlo todo. Por lo tanto, yo creo que poniendo en valor el multilateralismo organizaciones como esta, tenemos que tratar de caminar para que de una vez por todas se eh, produzcan eh, las debidas, digamos que... Eh, eh, comunicaciones y las debidas, eh, digamos que, eh, bueno, eh, relaciones diplomáticas para que eh, empecemos a ver de una vez por todas eh, la luz al final del túnel. Una luz al final del túnel que evidentemente tiene que recoger que, bueno, todos los eh, principios fundamentales de esta organización se cumplen, pero ya digo, creo que tenemos que, además de combatir la guerra, empezar a darle una oportunidad también a la paz. And now, from Armenia, Mrs. Maria Karapetian. Thank you, Madam Chair, dear colleagues. This year, the connection between security and economy has taken a new relevance for the whole world and this parliamentary assembly. I want to speak for the South Caucasus then. Armenia is a country that lives under an economic blockade by Azerbaijan and Turkey for already three decades. The November 9 announcement that ended the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war has a special point dedicated to deblocking all economic and transport links in the South Caucasus. This point gives hope that Azerbaijan would indeed turn the page of conflict as it often claims and start an era of cooperation in the South Caucasus. Azerbaijan has so far halted back the deblocking of all economic and transport links and insists on a special connection through Armenia without security and customs oversight of Armenia, a special corridor, as they call it. To justify this claim, Azerbaijan refers to the Lachin Corridor, stipulated by that same November 9 statement, and the corridor that Armenia uses to transport goods and humanitarian aid from Armenia to Nagorno-Karabakh. The Lachin Corridor is indeed not a road. It is a special humanitarian corridor. It is five kilometers wide, and it leads only to Nagorno-Karabakh and does not go anywhere else onwards. It leads to a dead end. It is solely used to transport goods and humanitarian aid from Armenia to Nagorno-Karabakh. The Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh are surrounded by their own defense forces and the Russian peacekeepers. These two are there only because the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh are also under a siege by the Azerbaijani army. The Lachin Corridor is therefore not part of an economic project, but a humanitarian corridor ensuring that Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh have access to food. Now coming back to the blocking of communications in the South Caucasus, Armenia is ready to open all, I underline all of its roads, for Azerbaijan to use. Azerbaijan has said that it believes that the citizens of Azerbaijan may fear passing through the roads of Armenia and coming into contact with the border and customs officers of Armenia. 
While we are okay with outsourcing the border and customs to a third-party service provider, we believe that it would be right if Azerbaijani officers control the border of Azerbaijan and Armenian officers control the border of Armenia. And most importantly, the deblocking of all transport and economic links in the region should happen in the spirit of ending conflict and starting cooperation, and not in the spirit of isolation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Karabedian. And now from Azerbaijan, Mr. Razai Kuliev. I am not going to answer, <laughs> to reply to Armenian <laughs> delegate. But, uh, Madam Chair, of course, uh, I do believe that we really are discussing a very important uh, issue about the economic and the environmental implications of the war in Ukraine. As my colleague from uh, 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 Austria, the rapporteur of the Second Committee rightly mentioned about the intention of the Second Committee to collect, to see some feedbacks from our uh, colleagues, fellow colleagues, about the, uh, our future plan and the future report that we are going to prepare for the annual session. Of course, I would say that uh, it is pretty much important to focus on energy security, food security, inflation, and uh, of course, the joint res respond to the f uh, other challenges that we are facing. And the most important, of course, the, the greatest need to ta tackle the issue of the, the efficiency of international transportation. Uh, I think that uh, it is really uh, great importance for the assembly. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would say that in the capacity of the head of Azerbaijan delegation, that Azerbaijan pays great attention to the energy security of Europe. As you may know that recently we have signed the memorandum of understanding with the European Union that uh, allows Azerbaijan to uh, double its energy supply to Europe up to 20 billion cubic meters. It is, of course, the good uh, sign for European energy security. And of course, talking about the uh, connectivity, I would say that, of course, uh, Azerbaijan plays a very important role in the middle corridor. And of course, Azerbaijan very much interested in expanding this, uh, the potential of the middle corridor uh, coming from middle, uh, let's say, Central Asia, passing through uh, South Caucasus, Turkey, and, the, and the Europe. In that context, of course, the reopening the, the communications uh, links uh, with Armenia is uh, an paramount, paramount of importance for us. Um, Armenian colleagues say that you, can call, you can't call this Zangazi corridor or the other, it doesn't matter. But for us, it is a Zangazi corridor. Uh, the perception of Armenia, I would say, uh, uh, needs to be clarified, it is not correct. Because if uh, we open the Zangazi corridor, all the regional actors and the people and country will benefit from that. Particularly, it will play a role of bridge uh, linking between Asia and Europe. This is why I would say that Armenian colleague to support this idea rather than to postpone or the torpedo this idea uh, because it really will be benefit for all the regional, uh, let's say, uh, countries. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kuliev. And now from Slovakia, Mr. Peter Osaski. Hey. My country is known that it's terribly dependent, was and is, on the Russian oil and gas. But thanks God, I can proudly announce that our government did the utmost possible not need to sell the freedom and independence of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters for oil and gas from empire of evil. We heard a very good presentation of colleague Kazmia Kleina about the millions and billions of destruction that made empire of evil in Ukraine. But I heard even now this afternoon some speeches that our role is first to be protecting our citizens. And when I think about the lessons I heard today, the most impressive information concerning the energy was for me the information from the ladies from the Ukrainian delegation. We should take all possible free generators and tents in our countries and send them to Ukraine because the freezing citizens 
need energy more than we that will step down from 24 in room to 19 because they are in danger of life. And so we never should exchange the fine presence of us for tragic fate of other people. My country was in the situation when Daladier and Chamberlain changed Czechoslovakia for so-called peace. It's the way to hell to make appeasement with evil in any field. And that's why we should always think about if we are ready to exchange energy, gas, oil, and anything with a clear evil for the bad fate of Ukraine. Slava Ukraine! Now, uh, from Estonia, our colleague Karko Sorin. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, the organization like OSCE unites the countries that share the same values. No other options are possible. We are not a country club. We stand for cooperation and security. Aggression is not allowed to any member of this organization. The Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, has stated, if Russia stops fighting, then we will have peace. But if Ukraine stops fighting, then Ukraine will cease to exist as an independent sovereign country, and threat and peace remains. So, aggressor has one option, to stop right now. But we have also one option, to stop the membership of the aggressor. There is no place for aggression in our family. And with the other hand, Give Ukrainians the weapons and let them finish the job. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, from Armenia, Mr. Edward Agajanian. No? No. no. Okay. No. Thank you. You are off the list then. <laughs> okay. Yes. And uh, the Turkey, Turkey delegation asks uh, one minute to reply. You've got one minute. Thank you. Sayın Başkan, Güney Kıbrıs Durum Yönetimi temsilcisinin asılsız iddialarına karşı cevap hakkımı kullanmak istiyorum. Uh, I would like to um, um, I would like to give the response to the um, allegation of the of the Greek Cypriot administration. Um, and as repre representatives of the Greek Cypriot administration abused the OCCAPA like other international fora. Güney Kıbrıs Rum Yönetimi temsilcileri her uluslararası platform gibi agit payı da istismar ediyor. Uh, they use this platform as a CPA like the other international forums to, uh, to abuse us. Gerçekleri çarpıtarak Türkiye'ye karşı hibrit saldırı yürü yürütüyor. They are continuing the hybrid attacks uh, against our country by distorting the facts. We reject these allegations. Bu iddiaları reddediyor ve bu tutumu kınıyoruz. Yes, we are against these allegations. Öte yandan Türkiye Kıbrıs adasında işgalci değildir. Uh, it is not the truth that we are occupying the island of Cyprus. 1974'te katliamları önlemek adına uluslararası hukuka uygun olarak bir barış hareketi yürütmüştür. We, we organized uh, um, the peace activities in 1974 to uh, pre prevent all this uh, human massacres on the according to the international law. Ukrayna'da bir sıcak savaş sürerken zaman ve enerjimizi boşa harcamak istemiyoruz. Uh, during this war in Ukraine, we don't want to use, overuse our energy and uh, our words. Kaldı ki Kıbrıslı Rum delegelerinin muhatabı biz değil, adadaki Kuzey Kıbrıslı Türk parlamenterlerdir. Uh, we are not counterparts uh, to discuss this matter with our Greek uh, Cyprus um, friends here. Uh, there is the matter of the, um, the, the citizens of, of Cy Turkish citizens of Cyprus and the, the two peoples, two nations uh, between them. Adada iki halk ve iki devlet vardır. Sorry. 
Kıbrıs Türk tarafı bu anlayışla adada iki devlet arasında işbirliğine dayalı bir ilişki kurmak istemektedir. And the, the Turkish, um, Turkish citizens of Cyprus, they want to continue the cooperation with the, the, the Greek friends. Bu arada Ermenistanlı meslektaşımıza tavsiyemiz halen süren normalleşme görüşmelerine destek vermelidir. Teşekkür ederim. Uh, we have uh, also the suggestion to our Armenian friends to continue the, 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 the talks and discussions about the, the peace matters. Thank you. Um, um, you were supposed to get one minute. You got three, but it was a translation. Okay. At this point, we conclude this uh, session. I would very much like to thank you all for your participation, for your valuable thoughts. And uh, with these thoughts, I leave you and I now declare the second session of the 2022 autumn meeting closed. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.